Welcome to Teaching with Comics. My name is Peter Carlson, and I'm a literacy curriculum specialist working with Green Dot Public Schools in Los Angeles, California. My friends, Susan and Otero, and I have regularly facilitate this Comic-Con workshop as a means to continue the dialogue involving comics and pedagogy. This yearly workshop at San Diego Comic-Con allows us to bring together an ever-changing and diverse group of comic creators, comic studies practitioners, and educators who use comics in classrooms, all into a room with a Comic-Con audience where everyone participates in a hands-on workshop full of pedagogical experiences involving comics. So let me introduce my friend and colleague, Susan Kirtley, who will let you know what's in store with this year's workshop panel. Hi, I'm Susan Kirtley. I'm a professor of English at Portland State University and also director of our comic studies program. And uh, I always look forward to our workshop every year at San Diego, working with the teachers. It's just my favorite uh, event. So as Peter said, unfortunately this year, we won't be able to be interacting with everyone in person, but we wanted to continue the conversation. And so we're very excited and delighted to be able to talk about comics and education with comics luminaries, uh, Matt Fraction and Kelly Sue DeConnick. So we'll be able to do that. And we hope that we will continue this conversation in person soon and online and so forth. So we're very excited to be continuing this talk both um, virtually and hopefully in person very soon. And joining us in the conversation is my colleague, Antero Garcia. Hi everybody, my name is Antero Garcia. I'm an assistant professor at Stanford University in the Graduate School of Education. And I think our goal for the next handful of minutes of this conversation really is for wherever you fall in the education spectrum, if you're a student, if you're a teacher, if you're somewhere in between in all of those spaces, um, to really think about what are the responsibilities in interpreting and creating and teaching with comics, right? What are the ways that the stories that are being told, um, and Kelly Sue and Matt Fraction are, are going to help us kind of think about this, what are the ways these stories instill a particular kind of civic responsibility in, in all of our actions, regardless of subject area or age? And so as you listen to this conversation, we're hoping that you're not just listening as a way to take, you know, really powerful stories that are being told, but as a way to help transform our pedagogy. And so, um, Maybe through um, the comics that hashtag, this could be a place to share out what are the way, what are the ways that you're taking lessons from this conversation? What are you moving forward in your own practice um, as uh, as these two luminaries are speaking to um, particular kinds of visions of justice with their work? So we're excited uh, for you to engage in this conversation with us, and we hope to do this in person uh, very soon. Susan and Taro and I are here to talk with Kelly Sue DeConnick and Matt Fraction, who in addition to their many creative and wildly popular accomplishments, are true advocates for the arts and civic engagement. They're part of Good Trouble Productions, which is collaboratively publishing Run, the follow-up to John Lewis's March trilogy. This new graphic novel will be out soon, and we wanted to start off by saying, um, how, what was the process in, in forming this uh, Good Trouble Productions? Andrew Iden. I think it all started, uh, Andrew Iden was a staffer of uh, John Lewis's and um, I had the opportunity to meet him at Dragon Con one year uh, when the Congressman was there and, um, and it, it was a really incredible, um, opportunity to to listen to the congressman and to have some um some time with him and andrew and then uh we sort of stayed in touch after that and then there was uh another an, another dragon con i think I, I should probably at some point like write all, how did this happen down because i'm gonna get asked this question uh, but there was a, another another Dragon Con where Matt and I were both there. And, uh, and Matt, I'm sorry, I'm gonna make an aside here. Are you okay with me telling? Yeah, just as long as I don't have to tell it because I, I wouldn't be able to tell it without getting tripped up. There was, there was another Dragon Con uh, a couple of years later the Congressman was there again and um, we got to spend some more time with him, uh, unfortunately, um, Matt's father was quite ill 
uh, and Matt ended up having to leave um, during the show. And uh, so I was at dinner with um, the Congressman and Andrew and uh, Lauren McCubbin when Matt texted to tell me that his father had passed. Um, and uh, and the Congressman was uh, extraordinary. Um, I mean, I think any, any human being under the, the, those circumstances, um, it's a, it's a, it was a, a, a crazy moment, but you know, we're, we're, we're all talking and, and I got that text and then, um, you know, it was like, excuse me, I, I'm going to have to excuse myself. We just got some bad family news and, uh, uh, and he, took my hand and uh, walked me to the elevator and made sure that um, that the folks at the restaurant uh, could get me, because of the crowds during the convention, the elevators were really booked. And um, he got someone to take me to a staff elevator so that I could get down and get to where I could speak to Matt. And um, and he was just, uh, uh, it was a very difficult time for our family. Um, and, uh, you know, it, in that moment, it was sort of all, we were getting an, an opportunity to meet this man who had been, uh, and who was an incredible figure in the civil rights movement and everything it is best to 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 be about being a person uh and you know when 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 that experience should have been all about us like sort of listening and learning from him and i guess we were but but what would he was modeling was just like this phenomenal um humaning and um and then uh, so that was a bit, uh, that was kind of a bond, you know, <laughs> like you, you don't forget a moment like that. And then, uh, um, Matt saw him, I believe at San Diego a few years. The ago. next, the next, the next sort year. of when I was, did my summer of apology tours for all of the shows that I had canceled because of, uh, my, my father, uh, the previous summer. And at one point, Andrew and Nate, and the congressmen were walking through or I was having breakfast and I jumped up to say hello to Andrew and Nate, kind of not really putting together. Oh, of course they would be with John Lewis, right? Uh, uh, and then and then said to the congressman, you know, I, I was supposed to meet you uh, last year uh, at Dragon Con and he kind of gasped and took both of my hands in his and said, your father passed. And like had it right there, right? Had it. I just I knew, and we just had a, uh, a, a another one of those a, a very human moment in the middle of San Diego, where human moments are kind of hard to come by sometimes, right? Uh, uh, and it so so they're 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 was a closeness, was a bond. He was hey hey in the sort of the worst year of you know my life. He sort of bookended with. John Lewis being there, right? Um, being there for my wife when this happened, and then kind of later, you know, uh, seeing me through it, and then and then, and just kind of concurrent to that experience uh, on a personal level, Kelly Sue had gotten to know Andrew, and then I got to know Andrew and got to kind of witness the meteoric uh, 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 velocity that that march kind of achieved and what it was a kind of phenomenon it became and sort of Mikel saw the congressman when he cosplayed as himself you know what I mean and stuff like that and sort of just to watch this uh this 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 thing happen sort of through the eyes of Andrew who had kind of fallen off of the turnip truck comics wise you know and was like is this a thing does this happen like I guess I'm you know suddenly you're on the today show or whatever like yeah that doesn't happen with your first comic right I get to know Andrew a bit, and um, he did a story for us on Bitch Planet. Um, 
and we were pretty friendly and people bring Matt and I business opportunities all the time. Um, and I would say- It's never that, not gross. Yeah, it, 99% of the time it's, all right, you're gonna be the middleman. And- um, You bring your friends intellectual properties to us. Wait, what? Okay. What? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's basically it. Like, bring us, bring us your friends and your taste and your name, and you get a cut. And it's like a comic book money launderer. Is this is this the role? Like an IP? Well, an IP launderer, really. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to limit it to just comics. It could be games. It could be yeah. mobisodes or shoes. It could be any. It is laundering, yes. But I don't want to limit it to any one particular yeah. mode or model. It's very, um, I think it's all legal, I think, but, um, but, it, but it always comes down to we, where we try to explain that A, we don't want to be middlemen and B, um, I would never advise someone to take a deal I wouldn't take. And when I look at these deals that they're suggesting that like, you know, you, you bring your friends and you get them to sign this, I'm like, I wouldn't sign that. How can I make someone else sign that? I couldn't do that. And so, you know, it just, uh, they never dovetail with our, um, with our ethics or our- Values. Values, I think is probably the better way to put that. And, um, uh, and so at some point, Andrew was like, I want to run an idea by you. And I was like, okay, <laughs> like, been here, but shoot, you know? And, um, and then his notion was, um, I want to form a company that does comics that are uh, nonfiction or historically based um, that are aimed at uh, schools and libraries. Like, um, you know, and that and that and that and that are steep to use the word values again in the values in the kind of mode of March and the congressman, right? Especially. As you know, I don't know. Uh, uh, as you know, if if you've read through the first volume of Run and some of March too, like like comics were an intrinsic part of the civil rights movement, right? There was, so this was kind of it felt like a a baton had been picked up uh, from from young John Lewis to old John Lewis, right? And and Andrew was like, oh, where do we go after beyond this, right? And what would that look like, and how would that work? Andrew brings a, a, a deep understanding of the government and of writing nonfiction. Uh, and Matt had done one nonfiction story before. I don't think I had ever done any nonfiction. Um, and but so we could bring uh, a, a pretty deep understanding of uh, comics and the 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 craft in particular. Like an, like an edit, like an editorial and a producerial kind of presence. You know, and Andrew brought um, uh, nonfiction and government. Um, and then we asked uh, Valentine Delandro to join us um, because we felt like we needed somebody who was an artist um, who could bring um, the, the art director component um, to it. And we started with our first book that we did and we get the congressman's blessing to use good trouble um and uh then our first book was for the new york public school system um and it was a, a book called registered uh that was about voting rights and it uses a, a fictional structure um to then educate um about the history of voting rights in a sort of beginner simple way in um and then the, i think our next project uh was an installation that used march uh right for uh ben and jerry's uh and then i think at that point was when um uh we were asked to join the team to work on run uh which was already in production when we joined but right, right. um 
Can I ask a, a clarifying? I don't. I don't think I knew about the Ben and Jerry's thing. Can Can you speak yeah. to what that is? Yeah. And did you it, also? It, it is it? exactly as weird as it sounds. An incredibly politically conscious company that wants to frequently put their money where their mouth, and more importantly, where their uh, where their uh, installation is, where their headquarters is. And it's a uh, corridor uh, in the kind of, you know, you, you know, you go see the Ben and Jerry's factory, right? It's like a tourist attraction in Vermont. And the tourist there's a, in Vermont, which is what was that? I, th I believe it is the biggest tourist attraction in Vermont. Uh, uh, I, much I, like I am the I, tallest I, man in my whole house. It is the biggest tourist attraction in Vermont, but it is, uh, uh, it is a public space and they use it for various uh, educational events. And so uh, Valentine, kind of developed a work with them. They sort of made a, a kind of like a March installation uh, 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 steeped with the work that, that Nate uh, had created uh, uh, for the three volumes of March and kind of telling the life story of, of, of Congressman Lewis um, from the Edmund Pettus Bridge to, to, to today, and, but sort of, yeah, it was just kind of wonderful, surreal. We had the same kind of reaction you did. Like, I'm sorry, like the ice cream people. Like cream. You know, it was a very, but yeah, and that's and so it was it was a chance to start to figure out how do you turn a non-fiction or his, piece of historical fiction into a kind of work that occupies a public space and kind of, you know what I mean? Like it was a, it was a, a you know, literally we have space to consider in this comic work now, you know what I mean? And, and, and uh, it was, a, I, don't, I don't remember how, it might still be up, I don't actually. It is still, it is still up. And, there, and you know, and it, also the whole thing happened. It was so good, they had to shut public tours down for like 15 months. <laughs> They did not let the public into this space. Like no one showed up at work, but they were like, no, 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 close it off. Keep it sealed off. No one's allowed inside. We started this project and then, um, and then the shutdown happened. And then, it, then there was a, a like, do, do we pivot to digital? What are we doing? When do we need to have a digital aspect of it? It, it turned out to, to just uh, uh, be this whole thing. And there was a, a, like, at, at one point I was pitching that we had a, um, that we build a statue of the Congressman so that you could, uh, was we were looking for interactive ways and like, so, so that you could kind of uh, uh, stand with him to, to, to join the march in a, in a way that you could, you could do that physically. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then it was like, well, you know, we don't, we don't want people- People touching stuff right now. <laughs> It, it, it was a whole the, but the the march the march kissing booth idea they shot down one of the cool things about it though was you know we we were it didn't it would it it fit our mission statement although not in a it, it was like well it's it's non-fictional and educational um but it uh it, it it was comics but not in a not in a incredibly literal way and so and not in a comic space you know so yeah. it would it would be surprising to people and and people could encounter it you're you know in in this kind of interactive physical way that makes you a part of simply by traveling from one end of the hall to the other you're activating the comic right um uh and yeah and it was it was uh uh and they sent us a lot of ice cream and that was very nice of them and they were wonderful to work with we're not the best business people in the world mm -hmm. um, uh, because that's not the most important thing mm -hmm. to us. Um, yeah, but it's funny, like the the um, registered, it was like a, like almost 200,000 copies. Uh, it would have made it one of the largest number of books, you know what I mean? But they were given away uh, to every 16, 17 and 18 year old New York public school system. Yeah. Um, um, but like, but the, that know, was that was pretty good numbers. Yes, the way good trouble works, though, at this point, anyway, is sort of that that like we make enough with one project to hire people to do another project, so that we can make enough from that one to hire some people to do another one, and then we yeah. do all the stuff that we can't hire out. So, um, but it's pretty great, and we are doing um, uh, so more, much more right now. We have. Oh. 
four. There's another, um, yeah. Right four. Now, I think. Maybe five. Um, no, five. We have five projects going right now. Um, so. Uh, and the idea is to eventually. What we're supposed, what we're allowed to talk about actually, but. Well, I'll just, okay. Well. It's just between us and the audience. There's, I'm sure. Okay. It's, oh, cool, okay. cool, cool, cool. That's totally cool. Fine. Okay. Um, but, the, but the idea then is to, to kind of keep finding ways to get comics that are either historical fiction, autobiographical, nonfiction into education, educational spaces and into the hands of young readers and learners um, and, and to continue the sort of tone and spirit of good trouble, you know? Well, I, I love registered that it, it does leave a little bit on a cliffhanger. You guys talked about the additional projects because I was just reading it just earlier today and it leaves on this cliffhanger something like coming up next. Oh, yeah, yeah, we did. That's right, Kel. They, told, they made us put that there's going to be more. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So they, there's like, it, I was excited. I was like, ooh, I want to read the next one. Um, yeah. And I, I love also you talked about it being, being given away. To, it's also available online. Online now, yeah. Yes. yeah. yes teachers who are listening to this it is a free download yes uh so we, we, we'll, make, we'll make sure that the link is in the show notes i don't actually have i i, I can't do that but i trust someone will but the goal then is to eventually actually be able to collect a kind of series of these issues in a kind of text in a design for a high school uh, uh classroom setting that, that sort of covers these different you know a sort of a back, yeah, a textbook of, of educational comics is kind of the ultimate goal. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, well, and they're so topical, obviously. I mean, right now, yeah. the, you know, register, sure. but it's in, in this wonderful frame of this almost magical realism, which is right. a really delightful frame for imparting this meticulously researched yeah. narrative right. and text. So it's really compelling. And, and um, also there's this, you know, delightfully meticulous research, which I think a lot of, um, you know, academics and educators will um, be able to draw on, you know, because they could provide primary texts and it'll initiate a lot of yeah. great discussions, which I, I really enjoyed. And the, bibli the bibliography is always super important, right? Like, like, make sure here to, to learn more, go here and this is where this came from. You know? um, I think it's also important for us as educators when we're working in an environment where uh, how do I say it? the truth is is people feel that it's malleable you know and you you get to these different um, lenses and these different sources and you get a different stories and so this as you say that sort of fastidious um, uh, attention to detail and all that regular rigorous documentation is so helpful um, in terms of teaching a text so we can go we can read this really compelling account and get people interested in it but then we can go back to these primary sources and say okay here's here's what they're telling us and here's how they differ. And thinking also in terms of a um, civic consciousness, like why do they differ? What can we make about that, you know, in terms of, of teaching, it's incredibly helpful. Um, and I can also tell there's a, like, you, there's this uh, feeling of responsibility because it's all tied back to your, um, what you've talked about your, you know, your ethics and values and wanting to make sure that you represent them as fully and completely as possible. Um, and I, I think that's a thing that that somewhere in the discourse um, it became uh, it became a sign of weakness to change your mind, which is the most uh, uh, peculiar thing. I, can, I I can't wrap my brain around that. How is uh, growth weakness? How it, what is is the assumption that we are born fully formed? Is that where we are now? Um, uh, I, I I don't get that at all. Um, uh, and then also that I, that I don't know isn't an appropriate answer, um, even when it's the honest answer. You should, you know, make something up if you don't know or guess or like, no, no, don't do that. Say, I don't know. Um, it's, it doesn't make you look stupid. It's actively destructive for you to assert something that you don't know. Uh, so I don't, I, those are the two enemies, I think, right now. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. The, the, the stories we've, we've, we've told have all been rooted in character, usually real, um, uh, or at least rooted in relationships in like the case of something like Registered. Um, 
to, it's not presented as a textbook. And to have a character say, I know people feel differently about this. This is how I feel, right? Or here's my, my, my perspective was this, or my memory is that. And, you know, and then how fun, and then to do something Rashomon-esque, you can have another character like, that's not how it happened. It went like this. You know, then, then you're really into kind of something that comics can handle wonderfully well with incredible deafness and uh, 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 alacrity. Is that the word? Sure. Um, um, that's a word, right? You should probably look it um, up. That's the I don't know. Uh, uh, it, it's something comics are real good at. And, and it, but then, so yeah, being able to present these histories told by the people that survived it, right? And we're all going to, every you know, and winners or losers are going to remember it different ways. And and every having playing in with the fungibility of that, and playing in with the fallibility of memory, and you know, just even even this, even in telling our own story, how I had skipped over the part where my dad died, right? Oh, I wonder why that happened, right? So, uh, 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 you know, like just to it, it, it makes these books rooted in hope, fact and, and, and history and truth, more human and more relatable and more understandable when, it, when, it, when they become stories that affect humans rather than this happened on this date to this person in this way. I mean, like I, I'm doing a book for DC right now that is, um, it's a history of the Amazons from the perspective of the Amazons. Um, and in the history of, you know, history is written by the victors. In the history of the war between the Amazon and the world of men, the world of men won. And so there is the history that you've been presented is not our history. And so this is our history. And, you know, it may not be true to them, but this is our truth. Um, and that kind of, um, I, I don't want to fudge the idea that they're, uh, I'm, not, I'm not taking a position that they're, well, there's no such thing as truth. They're, I, like, no, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> there, there is, um, but, uh, but human recollection and human context and framing of truth, uh, it's never without that context. Um, and I think that that is, an enormous responsibility um, and something to that we have to interrogate. Um, like whose context are we bringing to all of these stories? What does our own identity mean we have as sort of programmed defaults that we're not even aware of? Assumptions you just bring to the table. You reminded me of a book I used to teach 11th graders. Um, called Broken Spears, and it is the, um, the Aztec account of the Spanish conquest. Uh, and so, and it's, you know, it's, it's whose who's history is told, right? And so working with predominantly Black and Latinx students, right, it was a useful way for them to think about whose stories show up in our, in our textbooks, right? I think this has been a refrain of um, uh, Good Trouble Productions pushing against the textbook as like a, as a kind of text that's encountered in schools. I wanna ask, um, a question around theory of change for both of you as, it, as it's been written this and there's there's two routes I'll go so I'm going to say them both to get them out of the way and then I'll hopefully I'll just rant around this. So one is I think I think I hear from you that a good trouble productions theory of change is get these kind of highly compelling historically based accounts of important social justice issues into the hands of young people as a way to you know change hearts and minds kind of move in, in the direction of what the Congressman was doing, right, as, as a kind of change. And I'm wondering if that's the intentionality, if I'm, if I'm understanding that correctly, as well as, is that what you do in your, oftentimes like your predominantly fiction based comics writing as well? Is there, is there a different kind of theory of change of, as you're approaching something like non-compliance and Bitch Planet, or if you're thinking about um, gender or sexuality representation in sex criminals, for example, things that may not seem as, uh, actually, I don't think that I'm not even going to finish that sentence. I think they are both feel very social justice based. So I'm going to stop there and wondering broadly, theory of change, thoughts, question mark. Um, I mean, I, I hope. I, I often say, and I hope this is true, uh, or, or, or rather what I mean to say is I hope that I'm living up to this, uh, but um, I don't 
think it is my job as an artist to um, to suggest answers, right? If I had the answers, there are other fields that to where I should be. Um, uh, if I had the answers, I should run for office. Um, but um, but I think as artists, our job is to put questions into the world. And so I think it's, um, I think with, with good trouble, if we have a, uh, and I'm not um, familiar with this uh, phrase theory of change, but I'm, I'm gonna go read up on it because I like it. Um, but I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to be producing counter propaganda to propaganda that I feel is uh, uh, out there already. Um, what, what I would like to be a part of, and, I, and I'm not speaking for you, Matt, I'm using the I here on purpose, but I, I think we're probably on the same page about this, but I, um, I, I hope that the work that we do with Good Trouble is uh, empowering um, in the way that history can save us time, right? Um, uh, so I, I hope that, you know, the notion is that the more knowledge that we can pass down the, the, the more the next generation is able to advance because they don't have to relitigate some of these things. It's like, oh, that didn't work. Don't do that again, right? Like, um, uh, uh, so, you know, we, how can we refine what's been done before? So, so I think that I'm not trying to change hearts and minds in terms of persuasion, but rather to empower with, uh, with with history and uh, and also if I can get a little bit political if I have a political opinion here it is um, uh, not I, I don't think everybody needs to agree with me you know I'm not trying to necessarily win everyone over to my positions or whatever it's most of my positions again are questions but um, but rather um, uh, I think there has been a systematic undermining and lopping off of at the knees of uh, education in this country. Um, uh, I think that, uh, uh, and this time I'll get my tinfoil hat out, but I think that the libertarians have taken money out of schools um, to the point where they're starving and dying and the next generation isn't being taught rhetoric or debate or how to think like in, in the, you know, our teachers are keeping us afloat, paying for their classrooms out of their own pockets, um, you know, and that is obscene. And so, uh, so if I have a political agenda in this, that's it. It's not to, I mean, I, I hope seeing history brings us around to the same position, but really what I want to make sure of is that you have the, the, the next generation has the tools to think properly and to organize and to learn from what has come before. Um, and then to the, the second question, if I'm not, um, Hi, maybe hijacking this whole uh, uh, thing here, but um, to to the second part in in is that what I'm trying to do with my nonfiction work? Um, I hope not. Um, um, I like to think, um, and and this is maybe a thing. You know, I turned fifty this year, and um, uh, and, and in my The older I get, the more um, complexity I'm aware of, and, uh, and, and you know, and I hope 
what I'm doing as an artist and how I express myself uh, uh, in fiction is not, I don't, I don't want to be producing persuasive fiction. That's not my goal. Um, I hope what I am doing is um, exploring questions and topics that interest me. With Bitch Planet, Bitch, Bitch Planet is first and foremost a satire, um, you know, and it is, uh, it, it was a, a reaction to a lot of things, but, but you know, the, the general thing, like, I thought Captain Marvel was so benign in its feminism. And so, um, you, you know, no, nothing I had invented or was breaking new ground with in any way. And like, in, in, it was far less in your face than the 1977 version, you know, um, of uh, Carol is Miss Marvel. And then, you know, it, but, but then it was just like, you know, oh, she's a harpy and she's trying to stuff this stuff, you know, and it was like, really? Um, and so then it was, it was just like, like, that is not angry feminism. Those are fun blue sky books. And like, if you want to see angry feminism, I will hook you up. Um, you know, and that, that was sort of what, what Bitch Planet came. And then as Val and I were developing it and talking about it, we were, we were talking about exploitation and how much we love exploitation, but it is deeply problematic, right? And you, you know, you like you remember it one way, and and like there's 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 and you can see this in Captain Marvel too, right? And a lot of the things I've written in in Pretty Deadly, there, there's I always love that moment where she gets where our heroine gets back up, right? And like there's there's something when she lifts her head that's like, oh, y'all in trouble. Like, you know, uh, uh, like mama put the spoon down. You like, you're gonna, you should run. Um, like that's the moment I love. And that comes from exploitation so much, but in exploitation, it's usually in the context of like, oh, she's just been brutally raped, you know? And, or, or something that's like this distinctly, distinctively, distinctly male perspective and um, sexualized and uh, uh, salacious. And it was like, so, so the question that became our mission statement was, can we do exploitation that isn't exploitative? It was like, I don't know. I have no idea if that will work. And it feels wildly unsafe ergo that is the direction we should go right that that was what the, that that whole idea was all right that was the longest answer editor ever editor i'm sorry matthew to you no, look at that but pretend i said it first okay. <laughs> uh i i'm I, I won't be able to answer the first part better um and i can speak to my own experience on the second which like, I, I, i'm not I don't, I'm not a fan of agitprop, even if it's agitprop I agree with, and I don't think it's ever particularly deft or artful. You know, my, my it's, it's, uh, I don't, I don't feel conscious, deliberate obligation and um, objective to, uh, um, The book wouldn't have been genuine if it didn't cover what it covered and feature who it featured and talked about sex and all of its sexuality and sex and gender as a complex manifold of ideas that all of us find ourselves at different points on moment to moment. You know, it just wouldn't have been honest, you know, uh, like, yeah, like. Once upon a time in Hollywood, there were no black people. That's weird, right? Like that's that's a that's that's a problem I had with that movie. Is like, where is anyone of color in this experience of Los Angeles in 1969? Right? Um, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been genuine to, to to do a book about how we discover who and where we are as a part of that again manifold. It wouldn't have been genuine if it didn't talk about people who weren't me. 
uh, and it would have been a failure of empathy and a failure of imagination and, and creative cowardice. It was never about anything other than writing the book I wish existed in the world. And where does that take you? What does that require me to, 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 to learn, to go, to be, to empathize with, to, to imagine, to talk about, right? Um, and it still didn't get to everywhere we wanted to go, right? Um, because there's such an infinite kind of variety of, of people to talk about in the world. Like I was, that was kind of the realization was, was at some point I was like, oh, we could just tell stories about how everybody figures out who and what they are, right? And like, stopped caring, you know, we stopped caring about the criminals part of the sex criminals title, right? It was, it was sort of about sex and love and, and sexuality and not like, like the crime part stopped mattering. So it was like, all right, we've found where we need to be. Um, I'm not sure if that's an answer or a deflection or a, I don't know, that's what I got. Like a, a rumination seemed helpful. Sure, there you go. I'll yeah, say a few years ago, I, I, I was talking up sex criminals at the American Library Association at a, at a presentation uh, and I pitched it to them, only volume one was out at the time. And I mm -hmm. pitched it as these two people have sex to save a library. And that really got people excited right. about right. what the book was about. So librarians yeah. were You're writing our uh, catalog copy. <laughs> When Matt hitched uh, sex criminals to me, he came in and it was like, you know, I, 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 I think Chip and I are going to do this thing. And he told me about it and it, and it was like, you know, uh, I think he, it was like a sex comedy, like bridesmaids, you know, and, and I was like, okay, like, I went like, I not, it was like, not, not my jam, honey, but you do you. Um, and, uh, and then I read the first issue um, and got weepy. You know, it was like, oh, that is not what you did. You know, like uh, it is so much smarter. It's also, well, don't discount that I'm just bad at pitching. Well, it's okay. <laughs> I, I hate, I hate, I hate writing about what I want to write. Yeah. I just want to write the thing. I hate talking about what I want to write. I just want, like, I knew what it was. Yeah, you know, I might be projecting yeah. because um, I don't know. Yeah. I always think it's something else, and then it turns out to be this other. Uh, Kalisto, you mentioned, you know, as an artist, uh, the job description isn't like having having the answers. Um, when when I began teaching, Antero, one of the things he, I don't know, Antero, if you mentioned it to me or I use it in a, as a quote, as if you wrote it somewhere, but um, to pretend it's it's big and people buy it. But um, in in education, the the need to really promote students as producers instead of consumers. So that they're not just going through this system where, you know, it's not an assembly line of grades where you're like, all right, you know, you're line you up and let's just put all the parts that you need in grade nine and move you along. Um, and, and in doing that, um, you know, you, you really need as, as a teacher in the classroom to con continually find a variety of models. Um, for ways that people can communicate. Um, and so in English, you, you get to dive in and uh, like different storytelling. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I've, I've been able to do that with, with books, um, some of the books that you both have written and others. And that kind of came out, um, uh, I'll tell a brief story, that came out of back in the um, economic collapse of the, the, the first decade of the millennium. Um, I unfortunately had started teaching not long enough to have any type of job security. So um, every year I was laid off, but then rehired as a sub for myself until they could rehire me back on. And um, I don't know, Antero, why you did this, but he, he came he over fired you. as a way of <laughs> processing. He just was like, hey, all right, like, tell me the story up till now. And then he did. And I would tell the story and he just... Uh, wrote it on post-it notes and then we turned each post-it note into like a funny little page and then used an online comic program that I had been using with kids. Um, and we just made and then printed those out and just had a, my own little autobiographical, what the hell is happening to me in my, in my career. Um, uh, but I got to bring that in and then that became a unit that my kids would do. And that unit then developed into, well, I need to bring in more models because it can't just be mine um, and my, my story. And also kids, they need to express themselves. Sometimes a fantastical story would be better representative of what they're thinking or how they're feeling. Some 
you know, um, completely fabricated, even grounded in real life. And so I would bring in like issue number one of a bunch of different uh, comics and we would read those and then break those down. Like, you know, the, your, the Hawkeye book and the Captain Marvel book at that time, those were great. You know, when I say models of civic engagement, it was two ply because they both helped students see a different way of telling a story. Um, and, but then also the characters in there were consistently part of like having to have a little conflict here and there were like, they were very place-based. Um, even, even, even though Carol would be like, you know, a different planet, but she would definitely have to deal with like how that planet operates. What's the history there? How are the cultures interacting there? Um, and, uh, whereas Clint, he's like, all right, um, you know, I'm in my apartment, but things keep happening around and I'm actually going to try to do something to help everybody out. Um, so there's models of civic engagement were excellent to have because with, uh, with good trouble, it sounds like you're also now, um, you're also now activating more intently those true models that ha might have been overlooked in the dominant stories that have been told to our children and to through our schools um, for a long time. And, and storytellers. Yes. Like that's the other thing too, is finding, finding the storytellers and not having this all be the story of whomever as told through, as told from the perspective of, you know, two middle-aged white people or whatever. You know, when you're, you know, in these, pro you know, you say you've got like five, six projects working now and then run is coming out soon and registered has been out and is, is available. Um, getting it into the classrooms is like one thing, but how far into the thought have you considered of like, you know, what, what you expect or what you hope would happen with that content once it's in classrooms? I, I have to confess that it, it's never not genuinely startling that something I've done is spoken about anywhere, let alone a classroom or academic setting. And I, and I don't mean to sound self-deprecating and falsely modest. Like I, I can't, I don't let myself think in that direction or that shape or that, you know, it's, it's, and it's never not astonishing to me. It, uh, 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 that people, it finds places there, but I, I never, it's weird to, to like, I just don't write for an audience. <laughs> it's kind of the answer. And like, and I'm trying to unpack it, like with my therapist, I promise, but like, I really, it's the weirdest, like I really, and my, my, my perfect job is like, I would be paid to write and just put it into a drawer. Right. But like, it's, it's, I don't. The, the Emily Dickinson model, right? Like, the, and that's the ideal. Like, you do want to be writing for the drawer. But I want to be well paid for it. <laughs> like, does she? I don't think she talks about that. Like, I want cash. Yeah. For um, this drawer, I want to have a really a drawer with real deep pockets. But no, I, I don't. I my my. I am my. When I'm at my. When I can hold very very still and stay very very quiet i can write the book i want to read and that's really as far as i dare let myself think and that's real hard you know um matt you've talked about this a couple of times now in this conversation of like uh pitching gets in the way maybe of you doing the thing that you actually want to do or if you get in your head of like the thing you actually want to write, and I'm, I'm bastardizing what, what you said earlier. I mean, you, did, you nailed it. But I, to me, the connection I'm thinking of is the ways that schools often, we have brilliant genius kids in schools every day who, you know, Patricia Williams calls this spirit murdering, right? This is, we, we essentially kill their spirit of wanting to actually write and produce and make things dynamic because it becomes a five paragraph essay instead, right? And I guess I'm right. curious for both of you, is there, are there connections to formal education that that either suppressed or uh, uh, oh, yeah. Abs I, I mean, I, my life was saved by art school. I, I went to a, a, a the university. It was now the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. My senior year of high school, and I went from being a two point one to a four point oh student overnight. Um, public school uh, was a nightmare. 
Um, and, and there's a lot of other things going on, but like it was the difference. It was in, I, I became a different student. I became a, maybe I'm not gonna get out of high school kind of student, right? To my life changed and my grades changed and everything about what I did and how I did it changed. I learned how to work, right? It was school that changed you or you Absolutely. were ready to Absolutely. leave school? Absolutely. I was dying for it, begging for it. Absolutely. I was, I was aware of my edges being ground down and, and look, I was, you know, the first long haired, you know, acid dog in Cabarrus County, North Carolina since 1968. It wasn't the cool time for me, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I got, it was, it was all kinds of the wrong environment, right? So it, it absolutely changed my life, saved my life, you know? Um, I would not be here were it not for there. It was my Hogwarts, right? It was my everything. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a there's a I have an incredibly personal awareness of the transformative power of the right school, the right class, the right teacher, the right you know the right you know I, I it, it's everything right it's it's absolutely everything and and like Kel said earlier we we spent the last thirty years cutting it off at the knees and bleeding it dry and and leaving or future, you know, grinding them into, 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 I don't know, something. But, but like my initial reaction to formal education was, was, was really, really great. Um, and then, um, you know, junior high and, and uh, in the beginning of high school were, were a little bit rough, but then, um, but then I, I found, um, theater and speech and debate in high school and sort of found my people. Um, and, uh, and then that like, you know, carried me on into um, college and, uh, and on an arts program, even though I, I, I never studied writing. Um, I didn't expect that for myself. That was not in my, my plan. Um, the fact is, we are reading these in our classes and our students are responding and we as educators are responding and it's just such rich text both your fiction and your nonfiction. so i just want to say from us thank you for the work that you do you can now pretend that we're not reading it if it if it helps but thank but you. we are and it's incredibly um just incredibly rich and and so thank you for all that you do and for taking time to to chat with us today I, I, I said it in the beginning, but the, I think the recording wasn't on. So, um, so I will say it again that um, teachers and thank you, Matt, for the. <laughs> don't forget, um, uh, uh, teachers, librarians, and journalists are our real life superheroes, and so we. The only people that matter. <laughs> and book buyers. Yeah. <laughs> for large corp for large for large corporations. End cap designers. Um, and cap designers yes the uh, thumbnail designers yes no for, for real we're we are we are incredibly uh grateful um for all of the and indebted and yes and so um uh, however we can be of support um we're friends now we've hung out for like an hour so <laughs> um, all right tight now thank you thank you so much you guys this yeah thank wonderful. you so much really i really appreciate it thank you Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you once again for attending this year's Teaching with Comics workshop panel. We look forward to times soon to come where we will once again join together in the hustle of these inspiring Comic Cons, continuing to advance discussions and practices within the intersection of comic studies, comic creations, and comic fandom. Now, for example, Susan Ontario and I edited a book that was released last year called With Great Power Comes Great Pedagogy teaching, learning, and comics. This book is a direct outcome of the workshops that we have been and putting on at San Diego Comic-Con uh, for the past few years. This particular volume brings together comic creators, comic studies practitioners, and educators, all of them comic fans, and each one sharing insights and examples of studying comics, making comics, or using comics 
as, as a means to process ideas and information and to generate stories and narratives. We had a marvelous time putting it together and we know you'll find some things of great value in those pages. Uh, so we'd love it if you checked it out. For now, until the next time, uh, we wish you and yours all the best. Thanks again.